are going to wait till one minute past noon. We went from 31 to 40 attendees in just the last two minutes. So I kind of like to let few stragglers come on in the next minute. So thank you and hang with us. All righty then, if you just came on in the last couple of minutes, you are in the right place. If you're looking for a 12 lead pre-hospital EKG interpretation, I am not Nick Ensminger, I'm Dr. Jeff Keppel, and I'm the medical director of NorCal EMS. And we are glad to have um, all 45 of you thus far for this um, two hour uh, presentation workshop today with Nick Ensminger. And uh, I applaud you all for doing this on a Friday afternoon before Memorial Day weekend. And I just want to say that you can all take the rest of the day off, from my opinion, after this and head off on your fun Memorial Day weekend. So thanks for joining us. I first want to thank our sponsors. Our sponsors for this virtual conference series are Air Methods, PHI, Sac Valley MedShare and Banner Bank. So thanks to you all. Couldn't do it without you. This is the second lecture of our quarterly virtual conference series. Our first lecture being that of intensivist Dr. Dieter um, speaking on pediatric, tra pediatric trauma. And that is still available on our website. So please take a look at that if you haven't. It was a great talk. Today, um, as I mentioned, the title of this presentation is Pre-Hospital 12 Lead Interpretation, Identifying and Confirming Acute Changes in the Pre-Hospital Setting. There, I'm sure Nick will be giving the five different course objectives, and there will be a test uh, in order to get your continuing education credits. Just a little bio on Nick. Uh, Nick came to us about a year ago, and um, we've just been so happy to have his expertise um, and he he's been really he's been working in EMS for, for quite some time um, since 1997 both in a volunteer capacity um, but also uh, in a working capacity in a variety of settings all the way from frontier frontier to urban um, in the 911 response system He's assisted in training paramedics and emergency medical technicians for 15 years as a lecturer, a proctor, and a field training officer. Um, I love this in his bio. Um, it says, um, Mr. Insminger believes in the shortcomings of ego and the power of knowledge. And there's a lot of ego <laughs> in the medical field and physicians, medics, EMTs alike. Um, and Boy, just that one statement, if we could all learn a little something from that, I think um, this would be a worthy presentation. So there's power in knowledge and not in ego. Nick currently uh, lives in Northern California on a 22 acre homestead with his daughter and loving wife of nearly 10 years. I like this line too, his hobbies include parenting. That's the first one. <laughs> we should all ha have a hobby of parenting if we have kids. Uh, travel, carpentry, running, drumming, research, writing, teaching, and B action movies. And he currently works as a physician's assistant. So he's a PA uh, in the emergency department of a small level four trauma center. I also know that Nick is currently in a doctoral program for EMS. Um, and lastly, Nick is a published author, a link to his new book, The Insminger, Insminger Guide to Pre-Hospital 12 Lead Electrocardiogram Interpretation is available on our website. So you'll want to check that out. And with no further ado, I would like to introduce Nick. Well, <clears throat> I appreciate that introduction, Dr. Keppel. Um, yeah, I've been with NorCal for about a year and it's been such a privilege. They have such a great team here. Mark, Jenny, Donna, Kathy, Bill, Dr. Keppel. Um, I think things are really coming around and I really appreciate and honored for the um, ability to do this presentation today. Um, it's something I'm very passionate about. Um, it's a little backstory is um, early on, a lot of us that were in uh, EMS, especially within our paramedics, um, early in the 2000s or late 1990s, um, we only had the three lead monitor. So um, 
you know, 12 lead was never even in my mind. So once moving from one state to the next, and so I went to work in a more urban setting in Colorado, I had absolutely no knowledge of uh, how to interpret a 12 lead. And so I almost didn't get a job there because of that. Um, and I had to learn very quickly um, on how to do that. And so that knowledge came from me trying to boil down this huge topic into what I need to know fast and what is pertinent to my situation in order to one, survive working out there as well as to understand what I'm looking at. So a lot of what I put in this lecture as well as the book is um, some of those small tidbits or things that make a, a huge topic such as EKG interpretation and boil it down into a more simple uh, and um, focused uh, means of interpretation, especially for the EMS realm, because there's so you can learn so much out of this and you can know so much, but only so much is pertinent to what you're doing. And that comes from any specialty um, ranging from emergency medicine to, um, you know, family practice to urology, all those things. Everybody needs to know a little of something. Um, but if I could take this topic and focus it in for EMS, that's what I've been striving to do for years. Uh, and I began teaching up in uh, paramedics since 2005. So um, I was way too broad in the beginning. And as the years kind of went through, I, I really kind of narrowed it down. And that's what I kind of want to go over with you guys today. Um, there's a lot of topics in EKG interpretation. There's a lot of things people um, will often focus on that don't really have any pertinence to the field. So a lot of those things I'm not going to go over today. Um, and those are basically things like Bruges criteria or, or syndrome, uh, hemi blocks, um, all those kind of things that we, you know, you can identify those things, but they don't really factor into your treatment. Um, I'm just uh, focusing on some big topics, big things to identify, um, as well as some cheats on how to do that. Um, also, all of these EKGs in this lecture focus on adult EKGs. Um, uh, pediatric EKGs are a wholly, uh, whole different ballgame, so I'm uh, not focusing on those today. So without, and there's a lot of information here. I plan to go through the slides. Um, you know, if you have questions, please let Mark know. Um, I'm used to doing this in a smaller setting, so I, I have a lot of interaction, um, but please um, forward the questions to Mark and he will filter them through as needed or as uh, as they come about. So the this only will be available. this this uh, presentation will be available. Oh, so okay. they don't worry about writing these uh, all these notes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, my only financial disclaimer, I mean, I'm not profiting from this at all. It's just that I have written a book um, and there will be an email at the end if you guys are interested in purchasing it, saying it there at all. That's it. Basic objectives. I mean, a lot of you guys know and some of, I mean, some of you are very, very comfortable with this subject, um, but you kind of got to start from a basic um, standpoint and kind of build up from there, especially the people that are not very comfortable. What I've found is that as time has moved along in EMS and 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 12 lead interpretation has come about, expanding the, the surface area of the heart that we can look at now, which is such a huge impact. It's amazing how much we were missing uh, back in the days um, that some people have basically grasped or understand it, but some people are still very, very uncomfortable with it. Um, they a lot of times rely on the interpretation that the computer gives, which is not very always very accurate. Um, or they kind of just, you know, um, you know, just kind of believe that they see something and maybe they're questioning it a little bit. So what I want to do is I want to take their knowledge and hopefully give you a few uh, uh, factors that maybe help kind of solidify your knowledge a little bit. But without but before I can do that, basically, I have to do a little bit of basic anatomy, physiology, and electrophysiology to heart, which I know we all went over that in uh, paramedic school or nursing school or wherever we were, but that is important to know. Um, also, understanding how the EKG reads what it's looking at, how to identify the interpreted, interpret the acute changes, which is, of course, very important. And uh, the most important is how to apply this knowledge to the field setting. Um, without being able to apply knowledge to what you're doing. I mean, it's otherwise useless. So um, and then the last part is to practice to ensure that you're competent in it. Now, competency comes from repetitive uh, practice. So even if you get a little bit out of this lecture, um, if you just basically buy, you can even buy EKG books that just have nothing but 12 leads in them. If you work in a hospital, um, if you work in the field setting and someone has one, um, you basically just 
continuously go through and look at them. And I hope to give you a pattern to follow every time you look through them until that pattern becomes second nature. And eventually you'll start picking up and recognizing things and develop your comfort and confidence in the, in the subject. So basic anatomy and physiology. Now there's a lot going on in the heart. Um, the three main things that focus we focus on, especially with any function of the heart, are the flow, the stimulation, and the muscle. So the flow obviously comes from the coronary arteries. That's where the oxygenation and the nutrients come from. And that flows to the muscle. Um, the muscle is then stimulated by the nerve system. So, um, you know, the conduction through the heart. And so once it's con uh, the conduction comes through the heart, stimulates the muscle, and then it contracts and it moves throughout the body. These three components must work in unison to ensure perfusion. So if any one of those things is compromised in one way, uh, you're going to have some kind of acute uh, syndrome uh, that uh, is going to have lasting effects, especially on the function of the heart. The EKG is focuses on the stimulation, which is the conduction of the heart. Some people have a little hard time thinking about that because they think of coronary artery occlusion and then they think of EKG change. Um, it's not the coronary artery that you're looking at. You're actually looking at the conduction changes because the coronary artery is occluded. And we'll go over that a little bit more. So basic coronary flow. Now there's a lot of arteries of the heart. Um, there's you know very small ones such as the diagonal uh, artery, there's the marginal artery, all those kind of things. What I focus on is there's only a few, especially for EMS. And I think these things should be known primarily because where the occlusion is uh, occurs in the heart can have detrimental effects on you know, how bad the, the uh, MI will be. And you can actually identify the location and likelihood of where that coronary artery is occluded by just looking at the EKG. And I wanna go over some of those things uh, here shortly. Now, the, the coronary arteries branch into two sections. So coming off the um, uh, aorta, you have the right and the left main coronary artery. So the right main coronary artery goes around uh, the right atrium, around the right ventricle, and kind of includes a little bit of the posterior of the heart as you can kind of see in that. I don't know if you guys, I'm going to have a pointer here, but um, you can see the right coronary artery wraps around like so and then goes around the back of the heart. The left coronary, main coronary artery comes off the aorta and then it bifurcates into the, um, the left circumflex artery, which wraps around the lateral portion of the heart and around kind of a little bit posterior. And then the left anterior descending artery, which comes straight down the, the anterior portion and includes the septal arteries that come off of that. So that's kind of like the middle of the heart. Um, when you look at the EKG, and you'll be able to identify which areas those are affected. Now, the, when I talked about why you need to know this, because you can see if you have a coronary artery occlusion, say in the right main coronary artery, but kind of back in this area, you can see that you have a smaller surface area that's occluded and on the right side of the heart, which is not always the most uh, it's important, but it's not as much of an importance as the right or the left side of the heart because that supplies blood throughout the entire body. Now, if I get an occlusion up here in the left main coronary artery, I'm going to basically cancel out the left circumflex, the LAD, and the septal arteries, which is an entire huge section of the left side of the heart. So identifying those types of infarctions such as the left main coronary artery, or the, what they call the widow maker, which is the high uh, left anterior descending artery, which includes a huge portion of this part, the anterior of the heart. Those kind of things will clue you in to one, yes, the patient is having an MI, but two, how stable the patient's going to be and how long they're going to be able to tolerate that. So those are the kind of things that I, I kind of focus on with the artery flow that I want to go over with you too. Basic electrophysiology. Um, we all know, and I'll go through that on the next slide, um, as conduction goes down through the heart, um, it's designed to give preference to the left ventricle. Um, left ventricle, as we all know, pumps um, out the aorta, which perfuses the entire body. So it's the largest muscle in the, uh, in the heart, or largest portion within the heart, because it has such a big responsibility. Um, 
so the uh, the electrical conductor or the electrical wiring of the heart is actually set up to give preference to that left ventricle. Um, and as I said, the, it's the primary pump for systemic perfusion. So we all know this from paramedic school, the different sites. So there's the SA node, which is what causes the initial conduction, sets the rate of the heart. That goes down to the AV node, which basically brings it down into the ventricles. Uh, through the bundle of his, which is in the middle, down through the, and then as you go down through the bundle of hills, there's actually two fesicles that come off of that bundle that actually supply the uh, more uh, conduction to the left ventricle. And then as it goes down further towards the apex, you get the Purkinje fibers, which actually will um, cause conduction and contraction of the entire ventricle. There's a, the Bachman's branch basically comes over from the SA node and feeds that left um, atrium. We all remember this from uh, from uh, schooling. Each one of these things, with the exception of the Buckman's branch and the and fascicles, has a different um, heart rate that it would be set. So basically, there, it's all fail safe. So the SA nodes typically, you know, 60 to 100, that fails 40 to 60 AV. And then as you go down, the, the rate will get slower and slower. So this is an important concept a lot of the times when you're thinking about interpreting a an EKG is a lot of times students have a problem with this concept of what's the difference between an electrode and a lead. And those things are what look at um, the conduction through the heart that we saw in the last slide. So an electrode is the actual physical attachment. I mean, a lot of this may seem rudimentary to a lot of people, but some people don't think about this. It's actually what you're adhering to the chest. So that's actually sensing the conduction um, and where it is in relation to that position on the body. The lead is the path between the electrodes, so one or two, one or more points. So one thing I always thought about is, it always helped me, is that the electrodes are the two points on a map that start in the end, and the lead is the path between it. So as you're looking, you're, you're going from one point to the next point, and where that conduction is in relation to the path that you're walking. Um, and depending on the direction that you are walking, which are you, the impulse, are heading, the QRS will look differently. Um, as uh, your vantage point changes. So and we'll go over that. And this is what I mean. So there's different types of leads. Um, typically, there's a negative and a positive lead on any or, or electrode. I'm sorry, a negative and a positive electrode um, for these leads. If the, the impulse going through the heart is traveling towards a positive electrode, um, you get a positive complex. You guys can see over here. So it's an upright QRS. If it's going between the two leads, you'll get a what they call a biphasic, which is half and half. If it's going towards the negative lead, you get this negative deflection here. So that's important to know, and we'll kind of go over why that um, is important later. But this is how the EKG reads. So it's in relation to the positive electrode. If it's traveling away, traveling towards, or traveling between, is how your EKG or how your QRS complex is going to look. Um, so here's an example of the conduction through the heart coming from the AV node of a standard uh, healthy conduction going down through the apex. So you can see there that it goes down through the bundle and down towards the apex, and it gives a little extra to the left ventricle there. So it kind of goes down and out. So if you were to put the electrodes on the chest, so white on right, smoke over fire here, right? And you're looking specifically just at lead two, which looks from your uh, right shoulder to your left hip area, straight down like that. You can see it's in line with the conduction, so the conduction is heading towards that positive electrode, so the QRS will be positive. So if it's heading the other way towards the negative electrode, it would be the inverse, so it would be a negative deflection. Sometimes people have a little bit of difficulty with that, but we'll go over that a little bit further. And again, this is just refreshing um, what we talked about earlier, kind of the conduction through the heart there. The same goes for, you know, the three lead that we just talked about, but you placing the um, precordial leads on the heart, it's the exact same thing. Now, as we talked about earlier, going back, um, you can see that the, the frontal leads, white on right, smoke over fire, look at more of this primarily um, towards the apex depolarization. Whereas 
this little offshoot here going towards the left ventricle is what the precordial leads look at more and it's the exact same process. So each one of those electrodes that you place on the heart or on the chest to monitor the left ventricle there is a positive lead. So the conduction as it comes out towards any one of those leads will be positive or it will be negative as it uh, in relation to where it's placed. So proper placement is very important for that. Um, in the EMS setting, as we all know, textbook uh, placement is not always possible, um, but the best you can do it um, is important. The way I always look at it is if you find the xiphoid process, which is right here, you go basically two fingers above it, put one electrode on the right side, one electrode on the left side at the exact same level. Then you put one electrode just below the uh, left nipple, one electrode on the apex underneath the armpit at the same level as the first two, and then just fill in the blanks at the equidistant between them. That's the best you're going to probably get in the field. Some places will offer like the um, the EKG electrodes that come kind of standardly already placed and you just stick it on there and peel it off, but those aren't always available. But that's the best way and easiest and most simple way to do it uh, in a quick, quick manner. So based off those two things that we talked about, the frontal and the uh, horizontal leads, so white on right, smoke over fire, frontal leads, precordial leads, or sometimes called horizontal leads, are the V1 through 6 that look at that left ventricle. These are just kind of vantage points of where they set in relation to the coronary arteries. So you guys can kind of see where you might pick up some of the some of the um, infarcts and things like that. So if you're getting an infarct in the bottom of the heart, the inferior of the heart, you can see why lead 2, lead 3, and AVF would see that. If you're getting a lateral infarction, so over here you could see why lead 1 and AVL would have would be able to see that. You could also see why V5 and V6 would see that. Down to the septum of the heart or the anterior of the heart, you can see why V1, 2, and 3 would see that. So it's all in relation to where it's present. So um, that's why it's important to kind of understand where these electrodes are placed in relation to where the infarct uh, may be coming from. So we'll go over that more too. And so as I spoke about it, there's two different types. There's frontal leads and there's horizontal leads. So frontal leads are leads one, two, and three, or the AVR, AVF, and AVL. And they all use the same electrodes that we all have been placing on for a long time, the standard white on right, smoke over fire. Those electrodes, what they do is they look from a vantage point from the top of the heart to the bottom of the heart, so straight down, um, and pick up any electrodes or any um, electrical activity coming from that area. Um, what the what the precordial leads are, are what they refer to as horizontal leads. So these leads are placed V1 through 6, and what they look at is any kind of depolarization out towards the left breast. So the way that the heart pumps is it pumps down and out towards the left breast. So you're getting an entire um, viewpoint of all of that conduction in the standard heart. Um, to look at those two areas. Now, if you break up the EKG, you can actually separate these two vantage, vantage points, and we'll go over that too. So on a typical 12 lead printout, this is what you get. Now, this is a completely normal EKG. The way you determine between the frontal and the horizontal leads and which vantage you're looking at is you draw a line straight down the middle. Anything on the left side is gonna be the frontal leads. Anything on the right side is the horizontal leads. So frontal leads, top to bottom, horizontal leads, back to front, okay? So the deflection typically goes from the AV node towards the left hip, top to bottom. The horizontal leads go from the AV node down through the bundle and out towards the left breast. And that's where you're gonna look at the V1, V2, V3, V4, V5, V6 and that kind of separates the two. So if you were basically able to just completely take off the horizontal leads, you would just be removing V1 through six, and you would have what's left over from there. If you took off all the horizontal leads, you would only have V1 through six left there. So the way healthy conduction works in a heart is the frontal leads, like we said, move, look from top to bottom, and the, in a healthy heart without any, you know, say, a 
teenager or something without any kind of um, cardiac problems or anything, the impulse will leave the AV node and travel down towards the left hip. Typically, they stay at a 60 degree angle, but I mean, and um, that ensures depolarization through the bundle of his and up through the Purkinje fibers and ensures contraction. Because of that, typically to ensure uh, to to um, look at an EKG and ensure that the the conduction is 100% where it's supposed to be in a healthy heart, because of the placement of lead two, uh, the QRS complex within lead two should be the tallest uh, complex between one, two, and three, and we'll go over that in just a second. As it comes down the uh, bundle of his and moves out towards the left breast, the horizontal leads, remember they look from the back to the front. Most accurately, you could say from the right scapula to the left breast. Um, they look uh, down and laterally, like we talked about, and lead four receives the most input and the tallest QRS typically. Now this is a healthy heart, no underlying chronic conditions, never had an MI in the past, no congenital problems, nothing like that. So if you look at, so again, if you look at normal EKG criteria, you should have a sinus rhythm, you should have appropriate QRS, or PQRST, waveforward morphology. So you guys all know the PQRST. Leads one, two, and three should have the should have positive uh, upright deflection, uh, negative in AVR, and precordial lead V4 should be the tallest deflection. So here's a normal EKG. So if you look at it, lead two, tall, compared to lead three and lead one. So that's good. And if you look over here at the precordial leads, V4 has the most upright. So that's normal conduction there. And it's a sinus rhythm. And you look in here and there's a, there's a P wave, there's a QRS wave, there's a T wave, and it's a sinus rhythm. There's not tachycardia, no bradycardia. Positive, positive. So that's a normal EKG. This, of course, is what we get in EMS typically. So textbook looks like this, as we all know, but EMS, this is what we end up with most of the time. So it's really hard to get the artifact out of it, but uh, you kind of do your best. So moving on, evolution of an MI. One thing that's important when you're doing an EKG and you have a chest pain patient, is important to know that only less than 50% of patients will have findings on their first EKG. You won't see ST depression, you won't see ST elevation, you won't see anything, and you got to basically go off your clinical findings and suspicion uh, in relation to these patients. How does the patient look? Um, how does their presentation? What is their chronic history? Um, what medications do they take? What is my suspicion that this person is actually having uh, a myocardial infarction? And also of that, of those 50%, only 10% actually develop findings on subsequent EKGs. So you may never actually see anything at all. Um, the, e, the ED staff may not see anything at all when they first come in, but that's why we have troponins, that's why we have further testing, and that's why we have clinical suspicion. Um, and in the fields, we don't have troponins, so a lot of this is based off your clinical suspicion. So most of those EKGs you see will be 100% normal, so that's important to know. And this is kind of what we talked about, those three factors in the beginning. The way that uh, an MI to think about it is, is that there's several steps. So a coronary artery has to be partially or completely occluded, and that leads to muscle damage. And as the muscle damages from lack of nutrients, lack of oxygen, things like that, then you start to get the conduction change. So whether that's the slowing of the heart, speeding of the heart, or if that's an electrolyte issue, um, action potential, we don't really go over this, but cellular, um, exchanges of different electrolyte changes will cause those ST depressions, ST elevations, all those kind of things. So it's a process of one, two, three as you go down the scale. There's two types of an MI that we all know about. There's a STEMI and a non-STEMI. Um, both are considered within the acute coronary syndrome spectrum. Um, a non-STEMI is a decreased or partial occlusion a lot of the time, or it can actually be caused by a, a coronary artery spasm um, that causes a decreased oxygen or nutrient production to a specific region of the heart, depending on where that artery supplies. 
a lot of times what you'll get is ST depression or you'll get T wave aversion or you won't actually get any symptom or any findings at all. You'll just get basically chest pain or um, you know some other kind of uh, complaint that might lead you to there you they might have a, some kind of underlying cardiac condition. Now the way that differentiate those is typically within the emergency department with troponin levels. Um, once they get to the department uh, and they do a troponin, if the troponin is negative, um, typically that's considered a more of an angina. A lot of times those people improve with nitroglycerin versus a non-STEMI, which is a positive troponin without ST elevation. So you can have a non-STEMI with a normal EKG positive troponin or a non-STEMI with an ST depression or T wave inversion with a positive troponin. Now, because it's a partial occlusion or um, over time, these things can progress into a full occlusion or if the heart is just not healthy, um, over time that area can become increasingly starved for nutrients and that can actually progress into a STEMI, which is the traditional non or a ST elevation uh, myocardial infarction. So it can be ST depression or you don't see anything at all. You start to see ST depression as time goes along. You see ST elevation over time. So just know that a STEMI can turn into a or a non-STEMI can turn into a non-STEMI or into a STEMI over time. Here's some examples of a non-STEMI versus STEMI. You guys can see on the left here, you get the ST depression in the lower leads here. You don't have any ST elevation, but over here on the STEMI, you definitely have that pronounced ST elevation here. So those are the two differences that you see. This, if all of them look like this and they had a positive troponin, that would be a non-STEMI as well. As time goes by, um, your QRS is going to change during a myocardial infarction. So these changes um, are, Often what you'll see, now they'll vary based on the person's um, chronic condition. So if they've had MIs in the past, um, if they have COPD, if they have some kind of other chronic condition, uh, the QRS complex may look a little bit different. And also the time frames may be, not be as long or maybe shorter than what I have listed here. So you could obviously see if a, you know, a 30 year old has an M MI um, with no significant history, the progression of time may take a little bit longer, whereas a person in their you know, 70s or 80s with very poor health, this progression may be a lot sooner, a lot quicker um, than, it, than, it has, than it would be for that 30 year old. So, but typically the way it works is you start getting this chest pain um, and you know, depending on when you arrive on scene and you put the EKG on it, you might just get a normal complex and don't see much at all. But as time goes along, what you're gonna get is because a lot of times people just look straight for that ST elevation. So if the person presents like a cardiac patient, as you move along, you're not always gonna see ST to, or elevation first. Typically what you're gonna get is you're gonna get a T wave um, that becomes more and more pronounced. So it starts getting very, very large um, in one specific area of the heart. As time moves along, then you're gonna start to get that ST elevation off that Oops, I'm sorry, off the um, isoelectric line. So as that ST elevation progresses, it's gonna keep getting larger and larger until you get this looping. So a lot of times people will call this tombstone. As it progresses along after that, and the person has not arrested, you'll get this kind of biphasic um, type of waveform as the T wave inverts. And if the person doesn't arrest and they end up surviving, or say if they you know, have some kind of treatment or such, and they've had an MI, what you do is you end up getting this Q wave that starts to develop. Now this Q wave will stick around, so you'll be able to see this on prior EKGs in the future, uh, depending on which area of the heart was affected. So this is the common progression. So baseline, uh, hyperacute T wave, ST elevation, rounding, rounding with a T wave inversion, and then Q wave. And this is the damage as it goes along. So there's more damage as you're going this way. And then this is just necrotic right here. And this is the time frame typically. Like I said before, there's a lot of factors that influence the morphology and time frames here. So age and gender, younger, older, um, patient size and girth. A lot of times it's the EKGs or the QRSs will be very small on a larger person um, or very large on a very skinny person. Pre-existing conditions, 
Uh, COPD, heart failure, prior MI, you know, COPDers can have what they call core palm pulmonol, uh, ventricular strains, all those kind of things with CHFs, those all can influence what you're looking at. We're not really going over those in this lecture, but just know that chronic pre-existing conditions can have an influence on um, what your QRS looks like. So if you're up, your suspicion is there, but you can't 100% tell, always go with your you know, with clinical judgment in that situation. Drug use is a big one that can influence. Um, overdoses can have various uh, changes in the EKG morphology, as well as medications, all those kind of things can, just be aware. So diagnosis of an MI. So um, typically the, the, the HA criteria for diagnosing an EKG is uh, depending on where the actual infarct is, is located. So whether it's a horizontal lead or whether it's a frontal lead. So what they typically recommend is two millimeters in two regions of the same portion of the heart on the horizontal leads one through four. So if you have the same findings in two leads that are right next to each other in the same portion of the heart on the horizontal leads, that's indicative of a positive for likely MI. With the frontal leads or the limb leads, right on right, smoke over fire, it's one millimeter. Typically, I mean, it depends on which region you're working in. It varies in either way. Uh, what I always see is that, say, is that one millimeter can be something, you know, uh, uh, that should be noted in a patient that has really bad history, chronic history, or is presenting as if they are a cardiac patient. So always err on the side of caution. Um, and then posterior MIs, uh, we'll go over that in a little bit with the, with how to identify that. So a lot of times people will ask, you know, there's a lot of different various ways to actually identify and look at the EKG and say, hey, where, well, where is this infarct? How do I, how do I even know where I'm looking or how do I identify that? And there is a, there's a several cheating ways out there to do it. Um, I always had one. I've had other people tell me really great ones as well, uh, but this is the one that has always stuck with me. Um, this is just a quick layout of how, um, where the arteries are in relation to how the EKG printout is set. So some people are very color oriented. So um, just recognizing different colored zones actually helps them out, more of a visual type learner, um, with, the, with the orange being more of the lateral, the inferior being more of the pink, and the septal branch being the blue, with the anterior being green. Some people that helps quite a bit. Now I, I gave you guys, a, um, if you got the email that I sent out, it has a little cheat sheet on it that uh, you can go over with as well. But I wanted to show you one of the ways that I've always taught students um, that I found really helped me a lot, especially when I moved over to Colorado. So, so if you take an EKG, a lot of times you people, or you guys might've known this before, or, is that um, I always teach students to take the EKG and do this every time they get a, uh, a EKG printout. So what you do is you take it and you start marking on it. Now it's called the Lili Sal method. Some people call it Lili or Big Lie, Little Lie, S S A A L L. Either one, I call it Lili Sal. And what you do is you take the EKG, lay it down, and you start writing on it. So over lead one, you write L. Lead two, I. Lead three, I. We're going to skip ABR for now. ABL is L. ABF is I. So lie, lie. Then starting back up at V1 again, S, S, A, A, L, L. And so what that stands for is lateral, inferior, inferior, lateral, inferior, septal, septal, anterior, anterior, lateral, lateral. Okay. Now, once we go through all that and we'll come back to it, you're going to go back to AVR and I'll show you why. But I always have students write this down uh, on their EKGs every time because as they, over time, as you kind of come to understand where these different regions are, you're eventually just not going to need to write it down anymore uh, because you'll just know as this kind of subconscious thought of where everything is. We'll come back to that. So. Based off of that, so actually, let me come back to this really quick. Like we talked about with the AHA uh, criteria, is the way that this works is so if I'm looking for ST elevation in the inferior leads, 
two leads right next to each other would be lead two and lead three. So if I saw ST elevation here or ST depression here and here, and they look the same, that would be positive. If I saw it here and here, that would be positive. Um, these leads typically, if you think about it, where lead one, two, three, four, five, and six are all adhered to the chest, they're right next to each other. These can blend over into each other. So uh, positive here, positive here would be a septal. Here and here would be a septal anterior. Here and here, anterior, obviously. Anterior lateral will be here and here. Some people just call this anterior. So you might see that sometimes is V1 all the way through V4 is just anterior, but there are septal branches that come off of these two. So that's just important to know. Some people say lie, lie, all. So that's one thing to think about. So the different types of MIs are anterior septal, inferior, lateral, posterior, left main coronary artery, and the right ventricular MI. I think these are all important for the EMS setting to know. So if we had an EKG and we were in the field and we wanted to write down the li li sal method, so I put an L, put an I, put an I, X, skip, I, L, S, A, A, L, L, okay? So if we look at this, and we scan, and we'll go through an actual interpreting or a method of going through this. If you scale down, you can kind of look for things. So right in here, I see a tiny bit potentially of elevation there. So I would look to the next lateral lead, and I see it there too. So that's most likely a positive finding there. Then you can just keep going down. Do I see it in the inferior leads? No, no. Septal leads? No. I see something there. I see something there. And I definitely see that hyperacute T wave here. So you could call that lateral and anterior, septal anterior right there. So that's what the whole li li sal thing comes in. It's helping you identify the different specific areas of the heart. So if you move to an inferior, remember li li sal again, L I I. So you guys can definitely see here. The ST elevation confirmed here, confirmed here. So you have an inferior infarct there. Okay. A lateral, remember L I I, L I here. Um, you can see the ST elevation here. You can definitely see it there. Moving down, ST depression, ST depression, that's confirmatory, and we'll go over what that means a little bit later on. Now, a posterior MI is a little bit different. Some people will um, not actually see what this is, or they'll actually call it a non-STEMI. Um, way you identify a, a posterior infarct is that typically you have to look at the anterior or the precordial leads over here, horizontal leads. And what you'll get is you'll get ST depression in V1, V2, and V3 as you go down. And what that is, it's actually changes that are actually causing or occurring on the back side of the heart um, that you're actually seeing the inverse on the front side of the heart. And we'll go over that a little bit. But this pattern here, if you ever go through this and you see ST depression here, here, and here, you should be very highly suspicious of a posterior infarct. This is kind of a, a little bit of the way the leads sit in relation to where the infarct is. So this is the front of the heart, back of the heart. If you're having an infarction in the back of the heart here, um, if you put the leads on the back, you're going to get the ST elevation, but what you're going to see in the front is the, is the uh, inverse, which is the uh, ST depression. And we'll go over reciprocal changes here in a bit. There'll be more practice on this. And this is how you place them on the back of the heart. V7, V8, V9. I know I'm going kind of fast, but we'll go over that more in a minute. And so if you were to take a posterior EKG, place it on the back of the heart, run it again, you would get this. So you get the ST elevation here. So 
So a left main coronary artery occlusion is, is one to really watch out for. Sometimes people don't necessarily pick this up right away. They'll know that there's something going on if the heart's not stable, but they won't know exactly the uh, significance of it. So a left main coronary artery occlusion, if you think about it, is so high up that it affects the left side of the heart completely. So if you burn that out or if it's not getting enough nutrients or supply, the person's going to rest pretty quickly. And the way that you, that you identify this is you get this kind of global ischemia, if you guys see that everywhere. ST depression, ST depression, and you look over here, depression, depression, depression. And if you go down your LII, skip member, LI, SSA, ALL here, Remember what I said when you go through this and then eventually you're going to go back again and you go one to the next, you see depression, you see depression. I don't see any elevation. I don't, I see maybe a little bit there, but it's not there. So that's not confirmatory. Depression, 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 but I don't see any elevation. What you do is you actually go back to this AVR here. And if you see ST elevation there, that's what's confirming your left main coronary artery occlusion. So, Global ischemia with ST elevation here, that is a left main coronary artery occlusion. You guys can see it there. See it there. And then you look up here, and that's what's going to confirm that there. And, all right, right ventricular infarcts. Um, these are very common. A lot of times these are associated, or these are associated with inferior infarcts, like we talked about. Um, L, remember LII, so it's down in here, leads 2, 3, and AVF. So this is the bottom of portion of the heart, so the infarct can actually flow over and up into more of the right atrial area. So it can actually affect um, higher up into the right atrium. And the right atrium is actually a, is partially, or is, uh, is um, responsible for a lot of preload within the heart. So. These patients, if you ever see an inferior infarct, you want to be really highly um, cautious with nitroglycerin in these patients because if it's higher up in the uh, right coronary artery, what you'll get is you can actually bottom their blood pressure out pretty quick because you've actually reduced that preload within the right atrium. So these patients typically, if you ever see a right or a uh, inferior infarct, you want to bolus with some fluid. One way to determine whether or not it's higher up or in, you know, involving the right side of the heart is actually to do a right-sided EKG. Um, so any time you see this inferior infarct, it's a good idea to do one of two things. One, either bolus the patient with 500 cc's and then try nitroglycerin, or uh, you know, see if they actually have a right-sided infarct, and we'll go over that. So the way you do that is you take V4, which is on the left side of the heart, and you switch it over to the exact same portion on the other side of the chest, so just below the right nipple, and then you run the EKG again, ensuring that when the next EKG comes out that you, you, know, you note on the EKG that you have switched it. So the way it's going to look is, is that <clears throat> uh, it's going to be over here looking instead of over here because it's going to include more of the right side of the heart there. So when you get that EKG printed out, you guys can see here, you got the inferior infarct and then lead V4R over here, you can see the ST elevation there. So that confirms a right ventricular infarct there. So that person would definitely not be a person you'd want to give nitroglycerin to right off the bat. Reciprocal change uh, is an interesting concept. Uh, what it is, is like we talked about just with the posterior infarcts, is that the ST elevation is so prominent on one side of the heart, the inverse or back of the side of the heart will see uh, the mirror image of it. So up in here, the high lateral portion of the heart is infarcting, so you're getting ST elevation, whereas the inferior of the heart, which is the inverse to where it's going on, you'll start to see ST depression. Now, this is kind of an ominous sign over time, um, because this is getting so pronounced that you're actually seeing in a different area of the heart. Um, so anytime you see reciprocal change, the stability of the patient is um, 
uh, more and more concerning. So if you don't see it so much, the patient is still not 100% stable, but you have a little bit more time. So anytime you see reciprocal change, definitely be concerned about the patient's stability. So one thing I wanted to go over with really quick um, is, is, the, is cardiac access. It's something that some EMS providers um, do not understand. It doesn't really have a whole lot of practical uh, implications within the EMS um, setting, but it is important to know. Um, there are some indications where it, it can be used and can be beneficial. To, to what you're looking at. Also, even if you don't see anything on the EKG, any changes in a cardiac access means there's some kind of, uh, whether it's congenital or some kind of other underlying chronic issue that's going on um, that has changed uh, some, some direction of the conduction. And that's what cardiac access is. It means that the angle or where the, where the, the depolarization down through the heart is pointing, where the primary uh, direction that it's heading. Like I said with earlier, the, with the healthy EKG, lead two and uh, V4 should be the tallest in an EKG or a normal healthy EKG. Any shift in an axis is going to make, you know, V or uh, lead one taller or lead three taller or the, uh, you know, V3 or V5. One of the two, it's going to shift it a little bit and that's going to delay conduction through the heart. So that's important to know. Um, different things can cause changes in with uh, cardiac access, chronic disease, toxic agents, injuries can do it. Um, some of the things affiliated with a cardiac access are bundle branch blocks. Those are important, uh, especially a left bundle branch block, and we'll go over that. Um, the further the cardiac access shifts away from its norm, especially up towards the right shoulder, uh, we'll talk about that the more likely a patient can develop ventricular tachycardia. So if you see a patient that are, that's kind of complaining of these kind of heart palpitations, um, but your EKG is normal, um, if you can identify that they have a right access, you know, they may be going in and out of ventricular tachycardia and they need to be monitored a little bit sooner or a little bit longer. So we'll go over that. So like we talked about before, that normal access or uh, Lead two should be the tallest when you're looking at the frontal lead. So that impulse as it travels down through, down towards the positive of uh, lead two here. You can see that right here. So anything within this green area still focuses on the left side of the heart. If you start changing this axis, as, oh, I'm sorry, as it gets further and further away and kind of comes up here, you're, you're moving it away from the left side of the heart. So that left portion of the heart is not getting as much stimulation as it did before. Or if it's moving up towards the left, the left side, it's moving away from this. So the, the heart is gonna weaken and it's amount that it can actually contract and pump out uh, into the periphery. So that's why it's important to know and how to identify that. Now, cardiac access can be extremely confusing. Uh, there's different charts. It's basically, you know, that can show you how to identify it. You can actually get even rulers out that actually help you calculate. That doesn't really matter for EMS. So um, they have wheels, they have all kinds of stuff. So I, I just, I don't even mess around with that. Uh, one of the ways, the easiest ways to do it uh, is that this method that I kind of come up with a little bit. So you remember our normal EKG um, is uh, what we said, you know, two is the most upright, V4 is the most upright. If you're trying to determine the cardiac axis and where the impulse is headed, if you look into at lead one, two, and three, and all of these show a positive deflection, it's normal. You don't even have to worry about it anymore. That's normal. So if you're going through the path or the different uh, approach, and we'll go over this in a little bit, and these are all positive, that's normal. You don't, cardiac access is normal. Now, a way when they're not, so you can see this is positive, this is like biphasic, and this is negative. So to determine where the axis or where the impulse is pointed towards, you basically go print the sheet out, put it down like we did before, L-I-I, -I, skip, L-I-S-S-A-A-L-L-L, because you're gonna look for any kind of infarction there. If you wanna determine the axis, 
what you can do is you can put an, another L up here and another R right here, okay, on your sheet. So if I did that here and here on this EKG, you can see that lead one is positive, lead three is negative. So you're looking at which is it L or is it R that has the upright complex, it's L. So if I wanna confirm that L standing for left, R standing for right, that it's a left axis, I look at the AVL, which AVL sits on the left shoulder. So that would confirm left sided. Does that make sense? So if L has the upright and AVL is the upright because it's the left shoulder, that confirms left axis. Same goes the other way. Three is upright, four is not. If I wanted to confirm that, I would look at the right shoulder. The right shoulder is upright. It's the same, so that confirms it. So that's the right axis. Now, some people have a little bit difficulty with that, but that's uh, typically the easiest way to do it. Um, some people have like thumbs they put together, other kind of things like that. This is the best way I've found is just marking on the EKG and then comparing them. So posit or positive in R, I'm going to confirm it in the right shoulder. If it's positive in the right shoulder, those two match each other, then that's a right axis. Versus the other way, if it's positive and left, I'm going to confirm it in the left shoulder. If those two are upright, then it's a left axis. So here's an example. If you look at this, they are not all upright. This one is down. So if they're not all upright, that means I know there's an axis shift. So I see one is positive. So that's left. If I put an L right here, I would go to the left shoulder and that's positive two. So that's a left axis there. To get a little bit trickier, this is where I talked about ventricular tachycardia. It's hard to see, but you can see this is pointed down, this is pointed down, and this is pointed down, okay? Now, if they're all pointed down, that's a little bit of a different situation, but if they're all pointed down, that's typically a rightward axis, and you get the AVR up here. So right, right shoulder is upright here, so that's heading towards the right shoulder, so that's a right axis. I hope that didn't confuse too many people, but um, that's one way I found easier. Now, a lot of times when I lecture in this, uh, we take breaks and we go over a lot of this stuff. So um, all this stuff will be available online so you can go over it again as well. So the way that access typically comes the most important is when you're identifying a bundle branch block uh, in EMS. Now, you don't have to know the access. You could just identify that it's likely a bundle branch block um, and move from there. Um, there's two different types, obviously. There's a right and a left bundle branch block. Left being the most important to identify because left affects the left side of the heart. So if conduction is delayed to the left side of the heart, uh, you can have more lasting impacts in, in, the, in conduction and, and uh, perfusion. So we'll go over that real quick. And typically uh, to have a bundle branch block, um, you have to have a QRS that has a width greater than 1.2. And we all know that. Same, Nick. Yeah. Hey, so there is a question and actually I had to step away for five minutes, so I'm not exactly sure the context. Yeah. Um, the question is, why is only, I, I believe, AVR on right side at 12 lead needed? Would moving the rest of the electrodes over be more accurate? Yeah, I mean, you you can do that. Um, some people will, um, like in hospital settings, they'll move the entire thing. Um, a lot of times EMS wise, especially just moving one over there is, is efficient. And, you know, a lot of times during transport, this is happening or just of ease, um, it's, it's still gonna identify what you need to know uh, versus, you know, some of the other electrodes. Um, but just putting one right there, it will give you an accurate reading. There are some EKGs out there that you can get that will actually do that for you. I've seen 15 leads, which do posterior. And then there's also, I think there's even 18s or something that actually will add that onto it. Uh, but as far as EMS goes, just moving that one lead most of the time is sufficient in, in identifying what you need to know. Um, 
T typically, I mean, even with even if you just see an inferior infarct, you can you can have a suspicion that they might have right sided involvement. So just bolusing those patients, especially if they're not 100% stable, is not a or is not a bad idea. Um, moving the electrode over to identify a lot of times is just if you have time or if the patient is stable in some way. So I hope that answers your question. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So bundle branch blocks greater than 1.2 with the QRS. So the way to identify these, um, there's a lot of stuff out there. Some people say, you know, these rabbit ears, you look at one rabbit ear versus the other one being taller, being smaller. Um, I don't focus on rabbit ear things or anything. I usually just look at an EKG and if I can see that there's a wide complex, the way that I identify whether it's a right or a left um, bundle branch block is typically if you look at lead V1. Now, if you think about V1, V1 sits right on the sternum there. So the bundle of his run right next to V1. So that's what it's looking at is conduction straight through the bundle there. So any disturbance in V1 is going to be picked up, uh, or any uh, any any blockage in there is going to be picked up by that lead. So one cheating method is to think about is to look at the complex in V1, and whether it's an upright complex or if it's a negative deflected complex. So if you look at V1 and it's down, if you think of a turn signal on a car, and I flick that turn signal down. I'm going to turn to the left. So if that complex in V1 is wide and it is down, that is a left bundle branch block. If that complex is up right in V1 and I flick that um, uh, turn signal up, that's a right bundle branch block. So that's just the easiest way I've always determined to determine whether it's right or left. Now, sometimes you'll get this kind of like uh, different looking kind of, you know, several QRS and then um, you'll get like a R prime, like a like a kind of goes up, down, up, down. You, what you're looking for is where the majority of the QRS complex is. Is it above the isoelectric line or is it below the isoelectric line? If it's above it, it's right. If it's below it, it's left. So that's the easiest way to determine a bundle branch block, where it is left or right. So if you look at this, this is the, this is what a right bundle branch block looks at. So like we talked about, so I see that it's wide. So I, I, there's something going on there. I look at V1 and I can see the majority of the complex is above the isoelectric line and it's wide. So that's a right bundle branch block right there. So don't even worry about rabbit ears. That is above, majority above the isoelectric line. So the left bundle branch block is the exact opposite. So I see that it's wide throughout, but I look up here at V1 and I see it's below the isoelectric line. So that's a left bundle branch block. You guys can see it there. So it's below the isoelectric line here. Some of the things that it, a left, a, Bundle branch block is affiliated with is a leftward axis as well. So like we talked about earlier, if I put an L here, that's upright in the left side. I confirm it in the left shoulder, so left, so left axis there. So the criteria typically is wide QRS, left axis, and wide downward deflection in V1. That's that is a left bundle branch block. Now, even if you didn't get the axis part, if you just got the, this is wide and that is down and identify as a left bundle branch block, that's perfectly acceptable as well. Now, the where the left bundle branch blocks come in of importance is because it's very difficult to determine whether or not a person is having an MI in the field setting when they have a left bundle branch block. Um, because left bundle kind of throws everything off. The QRS looks weird. The ST segment looks weird. Um, all those kind of things will throw it a factor. So typically by the time they get to the hospital, you know, if they don't look really bad or if they're unstable uh, and they have a comparison X or EKG, they'll compare the two and they'll run cardiac markers to kind of see where it's at. 
Now, the thing I've always thought about, now there's different criteria, there's Scarbosa criteria, there's alternate kinds of things like that, um, modified Scarbosa, and we'll kind of talk about that just a little bit, is that if I look at a patient who I go to their house and they're having chest pain, and you ask them whether or not they have a history of cardiac problems, and they tell you no. Um, now, I know patients are not always the best historians, but they tell you no, you ask for their medications, you don't see any, and your suspicion is high that they probably are having some kind of cardiac event, and you put them on the EKG and you see a left bundle branch block. You should be pretty suspicious at that point. Um, while it's not very common, these new onset left bundle branch blocks can be attributed to a septal anterior infarct. Uh, it's a very small population, it's like two to four percent, um, but it still can be there. Um, so your suspicion should be elevated a little bit whenever you see that. So again, that's the patient that tells you, I have no history at all, I'm squeaky clean, um, I don't take any medications at all, I put them on the monitor, I see that left bundle branch block. Um, I had a patient years ago that was like that during a, um, it was a, um, like a bike race. The guy was in super good shape, no problems at all. Um, he went, uh, went down complaining of chest pain. We put him on the monitor. He had a left bundle branch block. Um, turned out he was having an MI. So just something to be very suspicious about. I've never been very big or I mean, I, I know it's important, but I've never been very good at remembering a lot of these criteria as far as Scarbosa criteria, because now there's modified Scarbosa, things like that. Um, it's really hard to use this in the pre-hospital setting. Um, some people would probably argue against that, but if you don't have a comparison at EKG, it's really hard to do. Uh, a lot of times, I always just taught people that you know, you can use this, but you should really go off your clinical suspicion on how the patient looks. Um, paced rhythms throw it off. Um, it's all about which way the ST elevation is. Um, if it, is it in the same direction as the QRS? Is it in the opposite direction of the QRS? Now, I advise you to know this because you should know this as far as testing and, you know, you may become way more knowledgeable at this the criteria than I am. Um, but it's something that is out there and you should know. But my, my suspicion always been, has been if I see a left bundle branch block and my patient looks very much cardiac, I'm going to treat accordingly. So it's very hard to, uh, even in the first place, to, uh, to call a STEMI activation based off a left bundle branch block. So it's a lot of its clinical suspicion anyway. So I put this up here. You guys should know this. Um, it's kind of hard to calculate points in the back of an ambulance. Sometimes you're doing so many different things. Um, but uh, you should be aware of that. All right, again, this would be a time when I'd be asking questions between each one of these sections to uh, to clarify it. So if you guys have any questions at any point, please pipe in uh, to, to Mark. So what I want to go through is I want to go through a means of field interpretation. So how I take all the information I just gave you and just how do I put it into some kind of pattern that I can use every time that I get an EKG that will help me identify and interpret the EKG. So I want to simplify that for you. Rule number one I always say is do not ever trust the computer interpretation. It can be wrong and also the computer interpretation as I always say it should only be used to confirm your findings. So if you go through the EKG and you see this, this, and this, and you're like, oh, maybe, and you look at what the interpretation says on the EKG, and it supports what you say, then that's one thing. But there's a lot of times that that will be way off, or it'll be really, really inconclusive. It won't give you an accurate picture of, of what the actual um, findings are. So you really need to know how to interpret this uh, in order to um, to, uh, to uh, actually treat your patient accordingly. So I, I have never trusted the computer interpretation. Um, when I worked in Colorado, they used to cover that up when they when during my uh, 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 internship. So it's one thing to think about with students, especially when they're uh, learning how to do it, is to cover that interpretation up first so they learn how to read it. So the way, the best way to me to interpret and to diagnose an EKG is to go through a pattern and do that same pattern 
every time. Don't you know, what, if you use that same pattern every time, eventually it's going to become a second nature. And so this is the way I've always taught students on how to do it. And the way I do or what I the way I teach them is that you lay out the EKG. You can put your LII, you know, S, your Lili Sal on there. And you go through a specific pattern starting up with lead one. So start up in the right side. And what you're looking for is you're looking for ST elevation like we talked about. So that ST segment above the isoelectric line that's going to confirm whether or not you have an MI. Now you'll find ST depression sometimes and that's important to confirm, but that's not your ultimate goal because your ultimate goal you're looking for ST elevation. Depression a lot of times is ischemia or reciprocal change. Elevation is actually injury. So this is the kind of pattern that I've, I've been teaching for quite some time. So starting up in V1, or sorry, lead one, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna look at V1, and I'm gonna look through the P, Q, R, S, T, and I'm gonna see right in here, there's an inverted T wave here a little bit. Here, there might be a little bit of ST depression here, in here. So I want to confirm if that's real or not. So the way that I confirm if that's real or not is I look at the next lateral lead. So the next lateral lead, if you remember, L, I, I, skip is L, which is right here, AVL. And you guys can see ST depression. There's definitely ST depression there. So that's confirmatory. So two leads have shown you there's ST depression. So that could be related to ischemia, or that could be a reciprocal change caused by ST elevation in a different section of the heart. So you're not done yet at that point. So what you do is you move to the next lead down, which is lead two, and you see ST elevation here. You guys can all see that. So to confirm that, you move to the next lead within the same region of the heart, which would be lead three. So remember L, I, I. So I see ST elevation, I see LC elevation, so that is confirmed. That is an, an inferior infarct. Now you could continue to go, so because the pattern goes here and they move down, up to here, down, 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 but you really don't need to even look any further because you've confirmed your diagnosis that a person's having an MI right now. You know it's an inferior MI. Now with the inferior MI, the thing you're gonna take into account, remember, is the treatment with nitroglycerin versus uh, fluids and such, but you really don't need to go much further after that because you've already confirmed that this is a inferior STEMI. This up here is lateral or is likely an inferior change or I'm sorry, reciprocal change. And you can notice that throughout the rest of the EKG. You can see it down in here too. So the second example, a little bit more going through the same pattern. Remember starting up here. So I'm going to look at B1 or lead one L here. I don't see anything really standing out to me here. T wave QRS, or I sorry, P wave QRS. T wave is a little bit big, but it's not huge. So I'm going to move down to the next lead, which is the I, which is inferior. Now, when I look at this, I see a T wave QRS, and I see a little bit of ischemia here, maybe. And if I want to confirm that, I go to the next inferior lead, which would be three, and I definitely see it there. So now I have ST depression in two leads, which is confirmatory. So now I don't know if that's reciprocal change or just ischemia, because if I go through this entire EKG and I don't see any ST elevation, this could be a non-STEMI right here. But what I'm looking for is the big one, the STEMI. So from that one, I move on. I skip AVR, remember, unless we have those global ischemia things that we talked about before, and I move down to the next lateral lead. We looked up here, we didn't see anything. We looked here, now I can see maybe there's something there, just a little bit, that looks off just a little bit. So what I do is I move to the next lateral lead. So if you remember, L-I-S-S-A-A-L. -S -S so this is the next lateral lead. So if I shoot straight across over here and I look at that, T, QRS, or sorry, P, QRS, T, I don't see any ST change there. So that is not confirmatory there. 
So because I don't see anything there, I move to the next lead. Now we're back down into the inferior lead, ST depression. We confirmed that over here already. So keep going. Now we move up into the horizontal leads. Remember looking out towards the left breast. And here I can see potential ST elevation and see how the T wave is starting to invert there. Remember if we remember the, the uh, progression that we talked about earlier, you get this kind of like winding inverted T wave. That needs to be confirmed. So what we move to is the next uh, lead. So some people call this septal lead. Some people call this one of the anterior leads. You move down. So I can see ST elevation here. That's confirmatory. I can keep moving down. I can see it here. It's confirmatory. And this is a huge hyperacute T wave here. So that's confirmatory too. So this you could call an anterior infarct or a septal anterior infarct. Now this is what they call that widow maker. So if you think about it, this sits uh, right on the sternum and it sits on the anterior portion of the heart. If you remember that left anterior descending runs right down where, uh, right down between where these leads are placed. So that LAD is a, is a big one. So that's one thing to watch about. So again, you don't need to go any further because that confirms your diagnosis at that point. Septal anterior infarct, likely inferior reciprocal change here. Done. So time to move after that one. So that's just a, that's a quick and easy way. Remember starting up in the left-hand corner, moving down. Anytime you see anything that looks suspicious, move to the next lead that's in the same region of the heart to try to confirm it. If it's there, it's confirmatory. If it's elevation and it's confirmed, you're done. If it's ST depression, it's there and it's confirmed. You move to the next one looking for ST elevation. <clears throat> if it's in one, you're seeing ST depression or elevation, you move to the next. So in, v, in lead one, which is the lateral lead, you move to AVL to confirm it. It's not there, it's not confirmatory, so you keep moving down. Um, so if you, if you go through that pattern, one of the things that I teach students is, uh, is an acronym called LEADS. So it's a way to approach the entire call in, in a cardiac patient. So um, after you get the EKG, so you're gonna get the EKG, you're gonna lay it out, you're gonna write all those things on it, LI, you know, li, li, sal, R and L if you wanna do the access to. Um, and a lot of EKGs will actually have lead two printed at the bottom. Now, when you first put on the EKG, you're gonna look at the underlying rhythm first anyway. So by looking at lead two, uh, you know, is the person in rapid, you know, SVT or the VTAC, is it something I need to deal with right now? Because if they have some kind of underlying algorithm or um, arrhythmia that needs to be dealt with, there's no point in doing an EK, a 12 lead EKG. So you're gonna look at lead two first always. And if you're handed an EKG, especially if you just show up on scene and you're looking at a 12 lead and that lead two is at the bottom, you're always gonna look at that first. Does this person have an arrhythmia that I need to treat now? So that's the L in leads, lead two. What's the underlying rhythm? Is it sinus rhythm? Is it sinus tac? Is it SVT? Is it AFib? Um, you know, do, do I need to deal with that right now? If you do, you're gonna treat, you're just gonna move on and treat accordingly. If not, you're gonna continue on to E, which is EKG changes, which is what we just went through in that pattern of looking in the left upper corner and going down through that same process, looking for an EST elevation or an EST depression. If you don't see anything at all, you can continue to A, which is look at the axis, remember L and R. Is it left, right, or normal? Um, is there evidence of a left bundle branch block there? Um, if yes, you know, stop. Consider your patient, what do they look like? Um, what is your clinical suspicion on the patient? If nothing at all, you go to D. I'm very big on differentials. Not every chest pain patient is a cardiac patient. Um, as we all know, uh, there's a lot of different things that can be happening underlying. Um, a perfect example is uh, years ago, um, I know that there was a, um, uh, a patient that uh, was younger complaining of chest pain. I think he was 16 or so. Um, and 
they went down the standard cardiac route. Um, this was in Colorado, put the EKG on him, didn't notice anything you know, drastic, nothing really stood out. Uh, following that kind of cookbook medicine, they gave him aspirin, they gave him nitroglycerin, um, nothing changed. They drove him to the hospital. Well, it turned out he had a pneumo, actually developed a huge tension pneumo and ended up going to surgery. So differentials, I mean, look at your patient, you know, 16 year old, tall and lanky, chest pain, no cardiac history, maybe not cardiac, I should still look into it, but if I'm looking at everything and it's completely normal, maybe I should look at my physical exam, I should look at their history, I should look at what they look like, um, what, what else might be a problem? Um, the 60 year old over, you know, overweight person or the, you know, 60 year old heavy smoker that's tall and lanky, um, that's having severe chest pain, um, you know, thoracic aneurysm is one of the things to watch out. They may be dissecting. Nitroglycerin to that patient might not be the greatest example so or thing to, to do. So always think of your differentials. If you're going through your EKGs and everything looks normal, um, it could be cardiac, but always think about other things that it may be as well. And if you think of it, you know, oh, this person might be having an aneurysm. Maybe think about checking, you know, blood pressures on bilateral arms, pulses, check their abdomen for pulsations, check all kinds of stuff. Um, and if all that stuff looked normal, the last thing it just, it boils down to S, just looking at stability. Just look at your patient. EKG looks fine. They're pink, warm, and dry. They're not in any distress. Their, their physical exam is normal. Doesn't mean there's nothing going on, but it means that you have time and the person is stable. So transport accordingly at that point. Now, if the person is, you know, you know, their EKG looks good, you've gone through your differentials, you can't figure out what's going on, but you look at the patient and their vital signs say their pressure is 86 over something, they're looking a little peaked, your suspicion is really high that something may be going on. Could be an end STEMI going on, but there could be something other like we talked about in the differentials going on as well. So those patients should be treated, you know, accordingly. So a lot of times that goes off your clinical suspicion, and especially the fact that EKGs, you know, 50% of the time show you nothing, um, always have that clinical judgment in there. And that's something that's developed over time. I'm sure a lot of you guys uh, and, and ladies have a lot of experience um, and you understand what I'm saying with that. So a lot of times that's really hard to teach students and newcomers, but it's, it's something that's very much uh, needed. So that's the LEADS acronym that I teach them. Look at LEAD2, then look for EKG changes, nothing, look at access, that looks fine, or nothing suspicious or I need to deal with right now. Look at, think of differentials. If the differentials don't really add up, then I just look at the patient and say, are they stable or not? If they're stable, I have time. If they're not, I should go. So that's that's that. So um, again, uh, any questions, please put them in the uh, the bar for Mark. Um, in the meantime, I just wanted to go through some EKGs and just see how you guys, um, I mean, I know that I can't see what uh, what uh, what your answers are, but I'm gonna give you guys a second on some of these and just kind of come up with what you think the, um, what, what you think the interpretation is. So a lot of these first ones are pretty easy. Um, I have some very more difficult ones in there, more standard that you might see in the EMS field. And then also I emailed out a little bit of a pretest earlier uh, that I wanna kind of go over some of the answers with that. So, all right. So I'm gonna give you guys a second on this one and see, and then we'll go over it real quick. I'll give you like 30 seconds. Okay, so <clears throat> if we took that pattern that we talked about and you were able to write on this, um, let's go back, L, I, I, skip, L, I, S, S, A, A, L, L, right? Starting up here in the right or the upper left-hand corner, I'm looking here, looking at the isoelectric line, P, Q, R, S, might be a little bit of elevation there. You guys see that? right there. So I want to confirm that in the next lateral lead, okay? So I'm coming over here to the next lateral lead, L, 
I can definitely see it there. See that? Very minuscule, but this is confirmatory. Very small. If you're on the fence, you're like, I don't know, that's pretty small. Keep going. So you move down to, to uh, I, which is inferior. Maybe depression, not much there. Kind of looks strange there, T wave inversion. That could be confirmatory. I'm still not 100% set on that. Skip. We looked at this one already. Moving down here, that looks pretty good compared to this over here. Then we're going to move up to here. Starting to see maybe a little bit of elevation here at septal S. Move down to a septal lead. I'm definitely seeing it here. That's confirmatory there. And I'm definitely seeing it here. You can see that hyperacute T wave there too. So this confirms right here. If you're not 100% sure this is a lateral infarct, looking up here and just moving on, you definitely can see it here. So you're you're done here. So you can definitely see there's a septal anterior infarct with likely lateral involvement here. Okay, so this is LAD, left circumflux. It's over here. If you think about it, remember those two bifurcate from each other. So this could be a little bit further up towards that bifurcation spot. All right, I'll give you 20 seconds on this one. Pretty simple. Okay, this one's pretty easy right off the bat. You would lay this one out, you'd be done really quickly because you're starting up at V1. Look at V1, I can see that pretty obvious there. I want to confirm it. AVL, L, I, I, skip, L, confirms right there. So you have a lateral infarct right there, okay? If you look at this other stuff, I mean, you wouldn't need to, but this is all reciprocal change. So remember, if you're seeing an inverse that on the other side that to what you're seeing there, that's more of an ominous sign. So this person's stability is not as, as good as if you didn't see this. So just be aware of that. Um, another way to think about uh, reciprocal change is that if you were to find the area of the heart, so the lateral portion where this is exactly infarcting and you were to stick a needle straight through it, with that needle point coming out on the other end is where you're going to see the reciprocal change. Okay. Kind of helps you hone in exactly where it is. Next one. Mark, did you say there was a question? I didn't see. There is a question. Uh Basically, it's could you just scan the EKG and see tombstone shapes in V1 and 4 and determine if there's a problem? Yeah, I mean, you can just scan uh, EKGs. I've never been one for that because um, you definitely need to recognize a pattern. I mean, over time, that's probably more experience comes along. You're probably just going to end up doing that. Um, but you can miss some things. I mean, if you just scan the EKG, um, you know, in, in a hurry, in a chaotic situation, things like that. Um, you can pick up on things, but a lot of times things just move along really quickly. So I've always I've encouraged, especially people that are not 100% solid on the subject, or if they're just learning it, you go through the same pattern every time. Now, eventually, like I said earlier, is that pattern is going to kind of just drift away and become subconscious over time. Um, and you're just going to be able to pick up changes without going through it. But I always encourage people in the beginning to uh, to um, go through a pattern and just to, uh, to recognize any changes. Um, and then, yeah. All right, so this one, starting up here, L, definitely depression. Moving to L, definitely depression there. Okay. Not ST elevation, but confirmatory. Could be reciprocal change, could be ischemia. Moving down to lead two, definite elevation. Confirm in the next inferior lead, elevation. So that's confirmatory. And then you move over here, you can definitely see it here. This is an inferior infarct here. 
So that's the one you would consider right-sided involvement, nitroglycerin, things like that. You could keep going if you want to, but you don't really have to. Um, if I wanted to go up here, I definitely see ST elevation. I can see it here. So there's some septal area there, but not so much over here, a little bit of that. But even if you just got to this section here, that's all you would need. This person needs a cardiac center um, or a, a, some kind of facility that has cardiac intervention. So that's the same patient if you did that uh, right-sided EKG. So remember, inferior, I move V4 over to the exact same portion on the right side of the chest. I redid it. I marked it as V4R. I have elevation over there. So that's confirmatory, right-sided infarct. All right. Give you guys a quick second. Even if you scan this one, I mean, with experience, you would definitely pick it up. This is uh, more what a you know, field EKG looks like. I'm sure a lot of you know what you get. So starting here, T wave is pretty pronounced. Remember the beginning of a T wave or a myocardial infarction, a lot of times you'll get a T wave uh, that's hyper acute. So I need to confirm that here. I have ST elevation, so that likely is confirmatory right there. If I'm not 100% convinced, move down. Inferior, I don't see anything there. Definite ST depression here, T wave inversion. Confirm that in the next inferior, next inferior, I'm sorry. I don't, well, I see it a little bit, so that's confirmatory. Moving up here, skip. We already saw that, we saw that. Move up here, ST elevation, yes, 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 yes. So that's the LAD again. So this would be septal anterior, or some people would just call it an interior, anterior infarct, either one. This. We saw this one earlier. <clears throat> the main thing with all that, I mean, it's all repetitive just practice just as if you can identify ST elevation ST depression and what a normal EKG looks like if you just keep going through this pattern over and over again or develop your own pattern in some way um, you're gonna you're not gonna miss anything I mean it, it becomes the entire process becomes pretty simple um, again so moving up here don't see too much depression depression confirmatory but not ST elevation skip and here's ST, uh, maybe ST elevation. Looking over here, I don't see anything. Saw that already, move up here. You can definitely see ST depression with the T wave inversion. Elevation, elevation, and definitely the hyper Q T wave. So that's, that's a positive right there. Septal anterior. Classic field EKG, <laughs> hard to interpret. Again, a lot of times going to go through, you know, with your clinical suspicion, looking at the patient. A lot of artifact in this, but you can get the gist of it. So L, lateral. I'm looking at this. This is definitely flipped. And it's with all of them flipped. So that's inverted in some way. So if I want to confirm that, I go here and I see the exact same thing. So that's confirmatory. Could be non STEMI, could be ischemia, could be reciprocal change. I don't know. I go down here. This is kind of hard to tell anything. Pretty close to the isoelectric line, but I don't see much. That's an inferior lead. Move down to the next inferior lead. Now, this T wave is looking pretty tall. So that's concerning. If I go over here, I definitely see another tall T wave here. So this one, I mean, if you have time to reprint, uh, another um, EKG to get a better view of it. I would definitely do that. But with this tall T wave here, confirmatory over here, that is a pretty good likelihood that that's an inferior infarct. Um, you don't necessarily see the ST elevation because um, of the artifact, but it's something to definitely be hyper aware of, especially looking at your patient. So if you're not 100% set, look over here. 
hard to tell, but don't see anything major. T wave is inverted though. T wave is inverted here. T wave is not here. That looks a little bit elevated, but it's not here. And then that looks okay. So this could be an inferior infarct here. And if you remember what we talked about before, if you look at V1, 2, and 3, and you ever start to get that ST depression here in these leads, you should think about a posterior infarct as well. A lot of times posterior and inferior infarcts are associated with each other, the way they wrap around the back of the heart, if you think about that um, right coronary artery. All right, so I'm just gonna tell you guys this one real quick. So this is definitely a posterior infarct like we just talked about, remember? So if we go through the, the, the um, steps, looking up here, lateral, a little bit of ST, go to the next lateral, I don't see anything. Inferior, maybe, that's kind of weird looking. Here, I don't see it at all, okay? Skip, we went there already. This definitely has a little bit. It's not a, in line with the next, or, so you didn't go, usually it's here and here or here and here, but these two are suspicious because you could have an inferior infarct going on there. But if you move up to V1, you can definitely see the ST depression here, V2 ST depression, ST depression. So that is concerning right there for a posterior infarct, especially in the setting of either a confirmed inferior infarct or a suspected one. So this person would get that posterior EKG uh, if you had time, um, or you would just treat accordingly uh, based off the patient's presentation. So if you don't have time, the patient's not stable, then you're not gonna, not gonna worry about that. So you can see that there, you can see it there. And if you did the EKG the other way, um, Um, I, I, you can see the um, ST elevation here, here, and here in, in the leads. Just always make sure that you mark on the, the new EKG which leads you're looking at. Sometimes they can get mixed up. So there was a question, are the infarcts old, older damage? Um, typically, the way the older damage looks like is you get um, ST, uh, or you get a Q wave that develops. Now, the Q wave... Um, typically will be a little bit more pronounced and it'll be in the same region of the heart. And usually you don't get so much of an ST change. So if this here was isoelectric both sides and you didn't see any elevation and you see a little bit of a Q wave there and a little bit of a Q wave there, it usually is a little bit more hyper pronounced. Uh, but those could be older infarcts. Yes, this over here, definitely not. I think I have an example of, a, of an older one in here somewhere. Okay, so here, here we go. So looking at this one, if we went through our pattern, L, I, I, right? Lateral, I don't see anything. Moving down to the next one. Inferior, that looks pretty good. You, some people might say one millimeter, but again, I don't look for zebras. I, I, would, I would look for more things that are pretty much like stand out to you. But if you wanted to confirm it, you'd go down to inferior. I don't see it at all there. So that's not confirmatory. Move up here, skip. AVL looks fine. Moving down here, I don't see anything. Moving up here, all looks good to me. That looks good to me. Looks good, looks good, looks good, looks good. See, that's a normal EKG there. If you want to confirm the conduction of the heart, the axis, you would look over here, one, two, and three. They're all upright, so it's a normal axis. Remember we talked about lead two, and typically in a, in a healthy heart should be the tallest because it's going down to the apex, and V4 going out towards the left breast should be the tallest, which it is. So this is a normal, healthy EKG right here. When I first taught this, I realized that I never put in a normal one. So <laughs> it made it hard to understand. <laughs> Nick, there was a question sure. about lead seven, eight, and nine. Sure. And if you could just kind of talk about moving the leads or sure. versus 
adding leads. They were kind of confused about that. Yeah, no, that's no problem. Yeah, so it all depends on which one. Some people will use um, uh, four, five, and six as their leads. Um, some people will use uh, two, three, and four. But generally, the easiest ones to do is if you take four, five, and six, and I, I had a picture earlier that I can, it'll be on the slides, and you take them off the body and you go behind uh, the and find the left um, the left scapula. If you put uh, V5 at the angle of the scapula on the bottom, so you, you're putting at the bottom of the scapula, and then you're putting V6 on the opposite side next to the spine and V4 more towards the axilla, so four, five, and six, um, you're gonna get, those become seven, eight, and nine. So when you redo the EKG, it's gonna print off those over here as four, five, and six, but you're gonna have to change them to seven, eight, and nine. Now, some places actually have a 15 leak EKG that you put on that actually wraps around to the back of the heart and does that for you, but not all of them do that. So you kind of have to jerry rig it a little bit, make it work. So taking those stickers off the left axilla, four, five, and six, and moving them to the back of the heart at exactly the same level, put the mid, uh, V5 at the bottom angle of the scapula, and then each other one on either side of that scapula electrode, then you get seven, eight, and nine. That's how that works. Okay, so there it is. And that was the normal one. So again, it just becomes second nature when you start doing this in these patterns. So you can see a little bit of ST change, T wave is inverted, confirmed here, not ST elevation. Moving down, inferior, ST elevation, definitely. ST elevation confirmed here, okay? If you wanted to keep going, we saw that, we saw that. Moving up here, depression, depression, depression. So inferior infarct, depression in one, two, and three, there's concern for posterior infarct there too. But even if you didn't go this far, your diagnosis is here. You already know it's a STEMI. So you could call STEMI at that point and start moving. All right, so what about this one? You don't have lead two, but if you put lead two on originally, before you did the EKG, you would see that the QRS is widened. So if you wanted to know if that is a left or a right, especially in the um, presence of chest pain, you would do a 12 lead EKG on the patient, okay? So doing a 12 lead EKG on the patient, remember what we talked about before, is you can't really see much in the way of ST elevation. Uh, or if you use scarbosis, sometimes, you know, you can. Um, what you do is you look over here at V1, if you guys remember. And if that turn signal method, so if I'm flipping the turn signal up, and if this was above that isoelectric line, that would be positive. That would be a right accent or a right bundle branch block. And since it's flipped down, that's a left bundle branch block. So I have a wide complex down in V1, and if I wanted to determine the axis, I look over here, remember put L here, R here, and I look at which one has the positive deflection, which is one, so L left is upright, and I wanted to confirm that, I would look at the left shoulder, which is AVL, L for left, and they're both upright, so that is a left axis. So wide, down, left axis, left bundle branch block. Now there's all kinds of other things like you can do. There's there's hemi fascicular blocks. There's all kinds of stuff. Um, that stuff's not so pertinent to EMS. But the main thing is identifying a bundle branch block, especially left bundle branch block, in the presence of no cardiac history, and they're presenting with cardiac symptoms. You should be hyper aware at that point. All right, so those uh, typically are pretty straightforward. Um, I have a few on here that might be a little bit more challenging. See what you guys think with these. So let's say this is a 62-year-old gentleman complaining of chest pain for 
um, four hours. And you show up and uh, fires there and they, they're ALS and they hand you an EKG and this is what you get. Give me a second. OK. So if you went through that same pattern we talked about, starting up here, lateral one. Now a P wave, QRS, T wave should be upright. It's not. See how it's down like that? Inverted here. That's not normal. So I want to confirm that the next lateral lead. So I look down here. So I see that. See that inversion there? That's confirmatory right here. There's a there's a change there. It's not an ST elevation, but there's a change there. So I'm going to look for ST elevation. So I'm going to go down here, inferior. I don't see it. Don't really see much. Maybe nah, that's pretty much normal. Don't see anything there. Skip. Saw that already. Inferior again. Looks fine. Come up here. You have a little bit of a biphasic a atrial node there, but that's nothing. But at the, otherwise, it looks maybe a little bit of an inverted T wave, but you move to the next one. You don't see anything at all. So that looks OK. Nothing really. I'm standing out there. Nothing standing out there. That looks OK and that looks OK. So I don't see any ST elevation, but I have this inverted T wave in the lateral leads. Now this is not a STEMI, but this is very well could be a non STEMI or an early STEMI here. So this change here, so this a lot of times will focus on your patient's presentation. You don't have uh, the ability to look at an old EKG because this may be found on an old EKG. You have to go off your patient's presentation at this point. So if they don't look good and their symptoms are, you know, chest pain or chest pressure and they have, you know, history of diabetes and they smoke a lot or anything like that, you should be highly suspicious at this point that there's probably some kind of underlying cardiac event. See that there and there and there. Challenging one. This one's difficult. <laughs> um, it's a hard one to go through, but if you did, you guys could see there's PACs in there, right? A lot of times you can see PACs. Everything looks weird. Um, not really much you can go off with this one, but if you got an EKG on this person, one, you can see it's irregular if you look at lead two. There's there's multifocal PVCs in there, which is a concern. Um, but if you went down the list here, um, it's not really 100% easy to see, but some things that will stand out for you. One, you can see that the, the P waves are a little bit elongated, but you can see there's some hyperacute T waves in here. No matter what, even if you're like, I have no idea if this person has a STEMI, they definitely have a cardiac problem. So anyway, this person's going to need cardiac intervention. Um, and you can't necessarily always diagnose a STEMI based off your EKG. So this one probably is not going to give you much information, but if you ever think of hyperacute T waves, there's one right there. I just wanted to show you. This one, a little bit tricky. Some people might say VTAC um, because of the shark tooth pattern. This is just an example of, remember we talked about as that ST segment gets higher and higher, It'll hit up that high on that QRS and it will actually start to meld together. So if you look at this QRS, this is actually dipped in. So this is actually ST depression. You can confirm it over here. And if you go down to the inferior, this is actually ST elevation here. You can confirm it in the inferiors there too. One way you can determine if it's not uh, like a bundle branch block or something like that is if you look over here a bundle branch block it'll be diffusely wide all over through through the entire EKG and these are all normal QRS is up here so that's one thing to 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 think about again more difficult EKG you're obviously going to know there's some kind of cardiac problem going on but just know that all the EKG morphology doesn't always look like a textbook 
This one here is important to note, like we talked about earlier. So if I started off with lateral L, I see depression, maybe. I go over here to the next lateral, I don't see any. I go to the inferior, I see depression. Go to the next inferior, depression, confirmed. Skip, we looked at that. The compression, depression is confirmed here and here. I go up here, I definitely see elevation. I don't see it here. So that's not confirmatory. Depression, 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 depression here. Remember we talked about it. if you get to the end and you don't find ST elevation, you go back to AVR and I can see ST elevation there. See that? So that is your uh, a uh, left main coronary artery occlusion right here. So that's global ischemia. You see it here, you see it here and diffusely through the horizontal leads with ST elevation here. Another one. Looks OK. ST elevation. Go to the next inferior lead. Kind of hard to tell. Moving over here, but you definitely see ST elevation here. So this is likely uh, they're a lead placement or something else, but you definitely have confirmatory here. We looked at that, moved up here. Don't really see much, don't really see much, don't really see much. So I would personally call this an inferior, starting here and here. All right, so that's all of what, uh, those, those uh, practice ones that I went over. Like I said, all of this is just repetitive over and over and over and over again. And eventually you're just gonna get to the point where like Mark said, is you just scan it, you see something, and then just look in another area of the heart and see. But I like to go through a pattern every time so I don't miss something. Um, and the main other things are is identifying the bundle branch block as well as um, what a right or a left main coronary artery occlusion looks like because those can be seen as just global ischemia, possible non stemi You know something's going on, but you'll miss the ST elevation in the, in the uh, AVR section. So just, just make sure you know about that. <clears throat> These were your uh, your uh, pre-tests <laughs> we went over that I included in your packet there. Um, this is a little bit of a different one, but it can be something you see. Uh, so you see ST depression here, confirmed here, not elevation though, moving down. No elevation, no elevation, looked at that, or skipped, looked at that, don't see anything. Possible elevation there. Definite elevation there. You guys remember we talked about this inverse. This you get this wavy thing going on here. Confirmed here. Not so much. Not so much. Not so much. So this is a septal anterior. This is actually referred to as a Wellens criteria. You'll get this weird wave pattern. But the, you know, it's not so important that you know that is that there is an ST elevation here and here, and the patterns are exactly the same in a chest pain patient. So that's a confirmatory septal anterior or anterior infarct. Here it is. Next one. You guys, we went through the same pattern. Potential depression. I don't see it over there. Moving down. Potentially, don't really see it. Skip. We already looked at that. Potential depression, maybe. Don't really see much there. A little bit lower. A little bit depression. Depression, depression, depression. I don't see any ST elevation, but I see a whole lot of depression. I go back up here. You can see ST elevation. So that's your left main coronary artery. Those patients are going to crump pretty fast if they don't get to a cath lab. Last one. Pretty simple. Starting up here, I definitely see ST elevation. Moving over to here, I confirm my ST elevation. Lateral infarct, if I wanted to keep going, don't see it. I see uh, ST depression. I see ST depression. That's likely an inferior change or a reciprocal change. Um, so moving up, I mean, you you like I said, you're you're done here. Once you know these two are there, you're done. 
So those are your lateral lateral infarcts. So there. This is just showing reciprocal change in these areas. Could be concerned for a posterior here also, but uh, this year you're done. All right, but that's all I got for you. I know that usually I'd like to do this course over like two days, so I know this is a lot of information right off the bat. Um, I just hope that some of this information kind of clarified a little bit. I know I went really fast on some of it, um, but uh, this, these slides will be available to you. Um, I also included my email at the end. If you guys have any questions at all, please contact me. Um, also, any feedback, um, any things that I could do better, um, anything that you guys see that would help explain it a little bit better, it's something I'm always trying to um, work towards because I want to make the, the content clear and understandable and as simple as possible. So uh, anything at all that you guys have uh, for me, let me know. And again, there's my email. So any any questions or anything? Again, I appreciate you guys coming uh, and uh, sitting through the lecture. You see anything, Mark? It doesn't look like we've got um, any questions. Uh, and we're, gosh, we're at 156. Good job, Nick. <laughs> Finishing <laughs> with perfect. three to four minutes to spare. Um, and uh, I'm sure Nick would be willing to take some questions even after the fact, right, Nick? Um, sure. mm -hmm. Yeah, so he's usually very available and responsive for that kind of thing. Um, gosh, I thought this was great. I learned some things and uh, I hope all of you did and that care will in our region will actually be even a little bit better as, as a result of this. So um, give us your feedback. We'd appreciate it. Be looking for another virtual conference lecture in August. And we'll be giving you plenty of heads up about that. So thanks everybody for coming. We really appreciate it and have a good weekend celebrating and honoring those who have died in our US military. So that's what this weekend's about. Thanks a bunch.